Facilities that make this program possible are provided by the City of Highland Park. Programs are produced independently by members of the community. The City of Highland Park is not affiliated with the following program or the producers of public access programming and is not responsible for the content. The following program does not reflect the opinions of the City of Highland Park. Welcome to Commons Current Events Roundtable. Today I have a wonderful guest and I'm so happy that he said he would come to the show to share what he has been, uh, what he's been dealing with for, since he was a little boy. And my guest is James Williams and we're going to be talking about living with autism, which James has had since he was born and uh, in his struggles. But one, one of the things that I'm very proud, I've read uh, his books, especially Out to Get Jack. Uh, he's an author and he is a speaker and he goes around all over the United States speaking about autism. Very nice to have you on my show. Uh, James, I'm, it's really exciting for me, and I really want to, I'm going to read a little bit about you, that somebody that was out to get Jack, that's the, um, this is the, uh, the main book that Jack, about uh, James has written, uh, James has written also the HAL experiment, and he's also written for younger children when, do you see it? <laughs> Okay, I think I got it upside down. Here it is. Okay, and then he's also written When Gary Comes Home to Play for Younger Children. And I'm sure there'll be, the next time I see James, there'll be more books on this table. And I read his last book and it was really, really good. And um, I just want to read something that uh, uh, Annabelle, Staley, she wrote, who is the author of The Sound of a Miracle, uh, A Tr Child's Triumph Over Autism, and she wrote about James. I have known James Williams most of his life, and I have seen him transform from a shy five-year-old into a thoughtful, articulate teenager. What he has to say about children who struggle with immense disabilities is valuable, not only to families who must struggle alongside them, but to teachers and professionals who endeavor to understand them. And Out to Get Jack uh, demonstrates that we all have a lot to learn, and gifted thinkers such as Jack can help us show us our way. And um, in this book, uh, in this book, James, um, there were things about it that uh, that was po possibly a little about you and how you had to deal with autism and uh, people uh, accusing you of doing the, the negative things when it wasn't your fault. And, you know, um, I know that you have, that you show that in the book. I know it's, it's a book that is, it's a novel, it's a short novel, but it was it's very well put together and uh, it shows you the struggles of, you know, socially being people accepting you the way you are and and you know getting people think you're the one that gets in the trouble when you're not and unable to tell people in your way that it wasn't about you talk about autism and what it was like growing up you live in the north shore uh in, in chicagoland area and tell what it was like as an autistic child in the north shore what were your the positive things and negative things that that you had to struggle with well, one thing I just want to mention is that although I spent much of my childhood growing up in the North Shore, it's not where I was born. I was born in New York City. And I was diagnosed with autism in New York City at the age of three. And my family realized that at the time, there wasn't a lot of awareness about autism or services for kids with autism in New York. So my family decided they wanted to leave New York and find a place that in their eyes had that better awareness. 
And my father, who'd grown up in the suburbs of Chicago as a child and also in the city proper for a while, basically told my mother, well, maybe I can take a look and see if there's a place in the North Shore where we can move to. So right around the time I turned four, my family and I, we moved to the North Shore. And we moved here because my parents felt that there'd be better autism awareness. And while the services weren't entirely perfect here at the time, there was awareness. My parents, growing up, they found organizations that understood autism. They found support groups. My mother and father both found friends that understood what it was like to have a kid with autism. So for the most part, one thing that um, defined my childhood growing up was, was my parents trying facilitating friendships with me. My parents were very active in finding kids they in the They sound very supportive. They were supportive. And, and as a child, they were very, very big on finding other kids that I'd get along with. And also speaking up for me in an area where, while many of the local schools weren't perfect in understanding autism, they felt that this was a place where they could be supported speaking up for me. So that was pretty much sums it up. Maybe you could tell some of our viewers what is autism and what it is that you struggle with. I know there are certain things like, uh, you know, social, social activities, being part of groups, um, and uh, it's, a, you know, a developmental disorder. Uh, characterized as it says in uh, Wikipedia, social interaction, communication, repetitive behavior, um, and these are some of the things that are you know uh, that people struggle with. There's different types of autism: high functioning, lower functioning, um, maintaining friendships. What was it like you, for you? What was some of the things that you noticed that were different about you that wasn't that other people didn't have, so to speak? Did you see anything that you saw that you could do or could not do that other people were able to do? Well, one thing you have to remember is that autism, although it has a very scientific definition, which you mentioned here, a lot of people with autism experience it differently. So to ask someone what is autism, you'd get a different answer if the person had a one, spec one part of the autism spectrum, if the person was a clinician, a parent. And in fact, at many autism conferences, a lot of people will have panels and not kind of have a universal agreement as to what autism is. is. It's, I, it's kind of remind, similar to that famous line that the old Hollywood actor Cary Grant famously said, everybody would like to be Cary Grant, so would I. <laughs> and I kind of feel like, you know, autism is the same way. A lot of people define autism, but there really is no one set definition for autism. There's just many similar definitions. But the one thing that most people would agree on when asked what is autism is that autism is a disability or a disorder that is comprised of many social issues. P kind of like the hallmark symptoms, that symptoms of autism are the social issues. And I can tell you, although I was diagnosed with autism at the age of three in New York, my parents didn't actually disclose to me I had autism until I was eight, long after I'd moved to the North Shore, specifically the town of Northbrook. But before the age of eight, I had pretty much figured out I was different. I noticed kids acted differently. I noticed that there were things they could do I couldn't. I noticed that I was getting disciplined a little more than other kids. That there's things that my parents expected me to know socially that I didn't. And I had just concluded, because I really didn't know any better, that kids just suffered. That suffering was just part of a child's life because I often felt like I was suffering. Here I was getting lectured, punished, sent to my room and disciplined for things when I really didn't understand why, what was so wrong about certain things that I did while other kids did. Like for instance, could you give me an example of something? Um, probably one hallmark example that not just demonstrates um, the struggles people with autism have, it also demonstrates communication issues. I was um, flying with my father out to Denver for a mini vacation. And um, at the time, 
Every other time I'd flown an airplane, my father and I had, a, had our own row to ourselves. And I didn't realize that people would share rows of seats with strangers. That was a routine occurrence. In fact, my parents had even told me, never talk to strangers, as often children are told growing mm -hmm. up. Great. So here I go on this flight out to Denver, and there's a stranger sitting on our row. And I'm thinking, my parents told me, never talk to strangers. Mm -hmm. And here I'm supposed to be friendly to a stranger. So I thought, well, if he's a stranger, and I'm not supposed to be talking to strangers, this guy is a thief. He's a jerk and a thief because he's taking our space. So I openly said to my father, do we have to sit next to that jerk? <laughs> now, I thought I was standing up for my father and I right to sit in that space. Small. Another pro The problem, though, was that he was African-American, so he thought I was being racist, when in reality, I wasn't even thinking in those terms. I was just a small child. I was thinking in terms of, What's this person doing here? In your row. A in our row, mm -hmm. and why is my father asking me to talk to a stranger when my parents and Barney told me on TV, never talk to strangers? See, so, you're not, as, so as an autistic child, you weren't able to differentiate the difference. Yeah. Normally, uh, when somebody says, don't talk to a stranger, they mean somebody comes up to you in, in the schoolyard or yeah. something. You know, you're walking home, and you, you know, to be careful, never talk to strangers, get into a, somebody's car but you didn't see that it was okay because they were sitting next to you in an airplane it was okay you know so I, they so it so it, it it wasn't the same thing so it's hard to differentiate between what those are the what you're talking about what you should do and what you shouldn't do and a right and say somebody that doesn't have autism they would know that immediately yeah and see that's probably one of the hardest things that people with autism deal with, although the details may differ in different parts of the country where mm -hmm. social rules often are going to be different, probably the one common social struggle we see in autism is the inability to differentiate different social contexts and how rules apply in different places. And you know, I really feel bad for my dad because at the time, I really didn't know how to communicate that to him. And although my dad, at the point he understood I had autism, he realized a misunderstanding was occurred, he really didn't understand, because I couldn't communicate to him why I said that, said that, and I really feel bad because I was never really able to communicate why I said that until two, two to three years mm -hmm. after it happened. Mm -hmm. And so I feel bad that I left my dad out on, that, out on that lurch, but I realize it was really due to social anxiety I had back then, and I profusely apologized when I explained to him what happened, and he, when I explained that to him, understood, then he understood it, yeah. what was going on. He knew it was a misunderstanding, but now he understood why. And this is why if there's any parent watching this right now, one thing I tell parents is find a way to communicate with your child. Because oftentimes when they behave in a way that upsets you or is inappropriate, there's probably some reason that, that the child might be thinking in their head to justify their disability or that justify their behavior because of their disability or autism mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that you might not understand but might be logical in the eyes of the child. And they see it only. You know, it's funny because when we were at the Bluegrass having a lunch today, uh, which was so delicious, by the way, um, I was noticing you were showing me eye contact. And a lot of the kids that I know that have autism, people that I do know that have autism, they could be on different levels, you know. We have family members that is on the spectrum of autism, and you taught me today that Asperger's is now part of the autism spectrum. There's no longer Asperger's, everything is under autism. And you were mentioning um, that to me, and you showed me eye contact, and, you, and even right now, now you're expressing with eye contact, and you said that you had to learn to do that. Remember, it wasn't something that was easy for you right away. People with autism doesn't always show. They, a lot of times when they're speaking, they will speak to you, you know, they'll talk to you without even, you know, just looking down, looking sideways, and not really showing, you know, and, and I see that you can express it. Was, was that hard for you to learn that? Uh, technique well, and how did you learn that did somebody teach it to you how did you you know when you were learning somebody had to well one of the things that um, that is not always understood and um, I, and the educational consultant um, dr. Richard Lavoie the creator of the educational 
awareness studio, how difficult can this be? be? He describes it a lot better than I would, so I'm just going to adapt my explanation from him. One of the things he points out is that there are two types of tasks that many professionals delineate. There are what he calls tasks that you can do while doing something else, multitask tasks, and then there are cognitive tasks. And a cognitive task is something that you can't focus on anything else. You have to have your entire brain power on on while you're doing it. And he gives an example of, you know, it's the difference between driving on a sunny day and driving during a hurricane. Now, if you're driving during a hurricane, you probably can't necessarily talk to other people while you're driving through that hurricane. Right. And so when you have autism, a lot of things that most people can do while they're multitasking are cognitive tasks for a person with autism. So one of the reasons why people with autism struggle with eye contact is because since the etiquette in conversation takes a lot more brain power than a person who's not autistic, they might have to spend so much energy thinking in their head, is this an appropriate thing for me to say? Am I saying the right thing? That they don't have the energy or brain power to make eye contact and consciously think about those things. Because one big difference between people with and without autism is that there's a lot of social behavior that's instinctive to a non-autistic person when you have autism it's not instinctive. They have to consciously remind themselves to behave in those ways. So what enabled me to understand eye contact was make me realize, okay, eye contact may be hard for me, but if I want to maintain a good relationship with a person, not necessarily a dating relationship, if I want to maintain that good social standing, then eye contact is something I have to constantly remind myself alongside those appropriate social cues and also appropriate things to say. And it was realizing when I was motivated to maintain those good terms that I was finally able to remember, okay, make that eye contact. Um, about 10 years ago, there was a pop song recorded in Sweden called What's In It For Me. Although that song was really a, was a song written by a wunderkind, a young Swedish pop star named Amy Diamond, and that was in the context of relationships, a lot of people with autism often kind of think that way. You know, what's in it for me? If I'm making eye contact and spending all this energy doing so, am I going to get something in return? Am I going to get your acceptance? Am I going to get that respect? And it was figuring out that there was something in it for me that was worth maintaining that brain power that ultimately enabled me to realize, hey, eye contact's an important thing. Yeah, because it makes, you, it makes the other person feel that what you're saying is uh, acceptable, because you know, when you're talking to somebody and they're not looking at you, you think, oh my god, I must, I must be boring to them that they don't even want to pay attention. And also, it's for you, it's, it gives credibility of what you're saying. So I think eye contact is, and it's very good that it, whoever taught it to you, it was a wonderful thing that they did because it makes you feel like you're being, it makes me feel that you're accepting me and I'm understanding you much better. Also, I just want to, we, we talked about, uh, uh, you said it's something, we currently live in a political climate here in the U.S. that is polarizing. How is our current political climate, uh, climate impacting people with autism in America? Well, one of the things that I think is very important for people to understand is the fact that everything, for the most part, really is contextual. So like even with eye contact, you know, we talk a lot about eye contact deficiencies in autism, but there are even social contacts, contexts where eye contact is not always part of the interaction. I remember when I first went to high school and I, figured, and I learned from some very wise friends that in today's high schools, teenagers don't necessarily give eye contact with each other because they often will look at their phones while they're talking and mm -hmm. that's actually not them being rude to each other, that's just how teenagers interact. I remember first getting upset when I was in high school and befriended, made some of my first friends, and I noticed they weren't looking at me. They were looking at their phones while talking to me, and one of them had to let me know, hey, don't get upset because we're not using eye contact. This is just what teenagers do. Right. But, but, but did, can you address the, yeah, the, yes. curm, the current political climate impacting because we don't have that much time. I can't believe we have 10 minutes left. But that was, but actually, supposed, that was actually supposed to lead to this question. Yes, okay. Um, one thing people, have, people know, who get to know me well know that I'm 
kind of a master of the Simpsons style non sequitur delivery. Every Simpsons episode starts with a with a um, opener that's different than the story. So the point of mentioning the cell phones was actually to lead to this. Okay. Lead to this. And a lot of people with autism will make those connections that not others have. So the connection here is just like, you know, eye content and everything is contextual. A lot of times, you know, political issues often mean something very different in the autism context than they do in the context of mainstream America. And one thing I learned when I was invited to attend a political convention related to autism is that currently, you know, we we think of polarization in terms of Democrats and Republicans. And oftentimes, the Democrats are hardwired to disagree with everything the Republicans want and vice versa. But what I learned at that, at that event is that there are policies that Democrats support and policies that Republicans support that can mean something very different in the context of autism. And so one thing I realized is that although this convention was comprised of Democrats and Republicans, we all connected at that event over certain policies that both parties support. That such, such as? Such as an example. A lot of people respect President Obama for the passage of the Affordable Care Act, which is very much a democratic thing. The Democratic Party has been for that. But the truth is, there were some parts of the Affordable Care Act that negatively impacted some families of individuals with autism. And although a large number of families with autism often are helped by social service programs and welfare programs the Democratic Party has historically supported, a lot of people got very upset who were in the autism community because the Affordable Care Act did some things that really hurt many of those families. So now you have a political dilemma. On, the, on one hand, a lot of policies the Democratic Party supports helps people with autism. But not many people in that party were willing to accept that certain parts of the Affordable Care Act hurt many of those families. But it works both ways because a lot of the, a lot of the right to work programs that are busting unions that Republicans support, a lot of the cuts to social service and welfare that Republicans support also hurt a lot of families impacted with autism too. So I think one of the issues is that we have a political climate that is so much focused on Democrat versus Republican, it's really ignoring communities like the autism community that can be caught in the middle of those fights and, and can be caught in the middle of how, of the fact that these policies are based on party ideologies that can help or hurt certain people in the middle. And so what, what is it as far as are people, you said something at lunch today that a lot of times you can't, if you start to, if you work, then you lose your um, benefits. That's one of the things that, that's been hard on the, the community, which it's children with disabilities, it's, it's really healthy for them to work. It's good, they have something to look forward to. But then you said something, the fact if they work, then their, uh, then their benefits can be cut. Well, absolutely, and um, just a quick disclaimer before I give this explanation. This is more of an explanation where I'm trying to describe some of the current struggles we have now. This is not in any way meant to be a necessarily a a statement against people working, but what issue that one of the issues that's emerging and what's sad is that this is an issue that isn't being necessarily discussed by either political party is that when a person gets disability benefits, they often get health insurance coverage. They often get certain other benefits like more housing that's more affordable because people on disability benefits can can go into more affordable apartment rentals. There are certain treatments that require you to have disability benefits to get. You get reduced fares on public transportation, which a lot of people need, need with disabilities who cannot drive. And there are these hidden benefits where life is made more affordable when you're on those benefits. Whereas, however, oftentimes when you're on benefits, there's limits to how much you can work, but there's, and one thing people don't realize is that on paper, it says, oh, you can work a certain hours and you don't lose your benefits. While you don't lose your benefits as a whole, the moment you start working in practice, you do lose some of your benefits. And sometimes that partial loss can often result in people losing certain 
health coverage, certain medical treatments that they rely on through their benefits. Um, one specific example I can think of here locally in Highland Park was, in Highland Park, there's this great company called Aspiratech. They've helped create jobs for many. Yeah, yeah I just learned about it yeah. today, and they hire people that are autistic. Yeah. And How well? I, and that's yeah. really, and one of the reasons because the person that owns the company, their own child has autism, and so they made it available. They're hiring people with autism, and I think that's remarkable. And Al although this company, they've helped m create many jobs, and adults with autism have actually moved to the North Shore from other parts of the country to work there. Mm -hmm. One of the sad things they've realized, though, is that some of their workers, because they lost disability benefits, lost some of their essential health coverage to maintain some of the services they needed as adults. Mm -hmm. And so what the heads of a Spiritech are trying to do is find ways to maintain their cause of employment, but also work with service providers so that if they hire someone, that person isn't worse off because they lost some necessary health coverage. So this is something that um, we really have to... We, see, we, most people don't know what people with disabilities, ha what, they're, what they have and what, they're, what, what can happen if they work or, or they even get married. They can lose their, their benefits. I know... Uh, a cousin of mine whose child has autism and she was afraid to get married because she was afraid that if she got married she, her daughter would lose her benefits and it should be just the opposite you know you, you should they should be able to get married people should be able to work and still maintain their benefits and it's not like this I mean we were talking at lunch and I was really surprised at some of the things that that you told me because most most of the viewers most of our public they don't really realize yeah. that this is the situation that this can that can really happen for people and uh, what can people in the North Shore do in order to improve the quality of life for their for residents with autism have you you have any ideas what we can do for well, you? I think one of the first things that people here locally have to realize is that is that instead of devolving into the partisanship politically when we're looking at the political views of local candidates 